want to thank you for joining us today here at Critty. We want to thank you for joining us today here at. Oh, f <laughs> <laughs> shut up! I'm gonna get it. We want to thank you here for joining us today here. So moving on to our other, uh, to our next. Uh, what the hell is this shit again? Moving on to our next. Uh, a what? As well as the enter to. Uh, as well as. Uh, a, so, so that we. Do you think I could do radio? You had the pace for it. It's, oh god, I hate you. What's new? Because I want need therapy. Can you see the tell the difference in the quality of the video? Unfortunately, yes, because your face blur. What are you doing? I am standing because I am getting swamp ass. <laughs> Dude, the one cheek sneak doesn't work when everybody's staring at you. <laughs> Did you not notice I increased oh, really? the size significantly? No, I'm, I'm oh my goodness. I'm also less dex like dirt. What? Damn, I'm <laughs> The system is down. If you have any feedback, other tips and tricks, or topics you'd like to discuss, please send them to us. One of the best parts of role playing games is character creation process. Do you guys agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you want to be a homely knight, an edgy rogue, a dark necromancer, the game is always better with more options. Oh, yeah. Yes. More class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have good class. <laughs> Those of us here at the Crit Academy absolutely love delving into complex designs for new class options. I can help the whip a name. Ugh. Watch me read. Shut up. Look what, what you've done. done. <laughs> it's Anyways. a permanent thing to this show. We all know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, after creating dozens of best selling products, uh, we've learned that each one, what makes each one balanced and, and fun and engaging to play. So, we're going to be talking about the Sawbones Rogue today. Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. Episode 297. Yeah. We're almost to 300, you guys. I am the host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Ian. I'm your co-host, Brandon. And we hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with you on your next tabletop adventure. Oh, shit. Before we get into today's main topic, you guys, there is a huge... Turd in the bowl. <laughs> Turd in the bowl, I guess. Um, as many of you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk of Wizards of the Coast and the own new OGL. I'm sorry, this is probably like your thousandth time hearing that word. Now, while this may not necessarily affect a bunch of players directly, it's going to it, it is affecting the community at large. The leaked document is not good for creators, and of course, Watsi's a little too late response does little to reassure small creators like us. Um, so first, we should like to point out that the current OGL is what allows us to be D&D content creators and was created with the idea that it will exist forever and could not be revoked. Okay. Now, Watsi themselves have said as much in the past as those that created the, uh, as have those that created the original documents. Now, we waited to make an official statement because we just want to make sure we hit all the information. Yeah, I mean, sure that's accurate. really important. And we wanted to verify that all the documents were from trustworthy sources. Now, at this point, Watsi's own official statement has verified the authenticity, authenticity of the leak, even though they claimed it's a draft version with a contract attached. Um, for Google to sign. Right. <laughs> 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 the current OGL fits on one page. If you have a third-party book, whether it's from us, another group, or Cobalt Press, you'll find that document either in the front or in the back. Revoking the current OGL mean, is meaning creators are no longer able to use it to create any new content. <laughs> well, for, this ver for the current version of the OGL. Now... Giving Watsi the right to use any of the content that you create using the new OGL 
any way they see fit without compensating you in any way or even giving you credit. So they could take your product, publish it themselves, not pay you a penny. Sounds to me like legal theft. And never even credit you. And that's, that's, that's not even the most of it. You know, mandatory report of not only your sales numbers, but the list of all your products and the prices that you sell them for. This would make it easy for them to see whose content is selling the most and will make it easier for them to choose what to take and publish as their own. Now, it also prevents you from pursuing legal action against them for any reason. Um, now, it also gives Wizards of the Coast the right to change the new OGL at any time with only 30 days notice. That's fucked up. Isn't it? That's the worst one. Uh, this could mean that if you run a Kickstarter like we do, um, and they suddenly change the rules before your product is published, you can now owe them a huge chunk of money. Uh, <laughs> and that is probably not part of your budget. So, and even worse, maybe you now can't even publish the book because the change took so much of your money, you don't have enough under this license. How shitty would that be? You got all these backers, right? And then you have to send out an email saying, sorry, we can't print your book because Watsi's greedy. Yeah, so, and, and Watsi has now released an official response that kind of backpedals on some of it. <clears throat> However, admitting it is even very admitting it was even there in the begin with is a huge red flag for small people like us. Um, many small creators have built their business on the promises of the current OGL that's lasted several decades and that it would always be valid in there for us. Even if the newer versions were created, that's very key, right? They could, it indicated they could update it and it, we could choose to use the older one if we want. You could just ignore it. But that's not what this new one did. That was new in claims anyway. Yes. Now, by even attempting to revoke the current OGL, they have basically lost all the trust of the community, including us here at Critic Academy. Now. They didn't so, think we were going to do anything. Everyone well, did. yeah. And it, there's a lot to it. But I'm not going to bore everyone with all the details. I just want you guys to know where we kind of stand. At this point... Crit Academy can no longer depend on Wizards of the Coast OGL uh, to create content, which sucks. We have a couple of 5e projects already in production that we hope will be available um, uh, to follow through on. And depending on the official new OGL ends up being, um, yeah, we'll see. We have a couple of other projects in the works that um, we will be converting to a system agnostic before they release. If you don't know what that is, it means it doesn't matter which fantasy RPG you play. It's still a powerful book and resource, much like a lot of the content we review. Now, moving forward, that in the short term, uh, we will be focusing on system agnostic content for all new publishing projects. In the long term, we are hoping projects such as Orc from Paizo, which is a uh, open RPG creative license, um, and by the Black Flag Initiative by Cobalt Press, which is a new RPG they're putting out that'll be based on the ORC. R. <laughs> will allow us to continue to create inspirational content for our supporters and fans under this new system. And I do want to point out, too, that they are by now the only publishers who are doing their own system. Kind yes, and that's going to that's gonna shatter us for a little while, I think. Yeah. Um, until one, like Highlander, until they're all slitting each other's heads off and one rises to the top of the mountain, that's kind of where we're going to be at. But I think that um, that gives us some good opportunity, right, to expand our horizons. So our podcast will actually be adapting to kind of focus on a mix of system agnostic content, a variety of RPGs and tabletop games, and still including 5e content from small creators who deserve to be supported. It's still a good game, and we like to put, we still enjoy that game. But we want to, as always, feature content we think is good. That's just not from first parties. Yeah, and that's and, and that's kind of 
where that's at right now. There are so many games out there. And I know Ian's played more than all of us, right? Yeah. I know he's got a bunch he's got that he hasn't played yet. I was like, you want to play this game? Me, if I bought it, I'll probably only ever play this if I bought it myself. So it actually, <laughs> it's actually kind of exciting, right? Yeah. Because this means we'll be able to play games and share our um, details with you. So uh, we will uh, try and focus on not only what makes these games great on their own, but how these ideas and concepts can be implemented in the games at your, in your games and at your tables. So we're super excited for that. Now our Patreon page is still going to include 5e content for all, all the time being, uh, but we will be transitioning over uh, time to a more system agnostic content there as well. And our goal is to continue to bring inspiration to your games, no matter what system you choose to run at your table. Now, we hope you guys all understand why we had to make this decision as a business. We have to look out for our future and protect the work and content that we spend so much time making. And we look forward to expanding our RPG knowledge <laughs> and hearing from all of you about the game, what games you love the most. Oh my God. What? All right, it's Andrew's thing. Holy shit. All right. So that was way longer than it was supposed to be, um, but it was very important. So how about we get into it? Today's main topic, you guys, is the Sawbones Rogue. If you haven't picked up our Extraordinary Expeditions book and or the new player, uh, Extraordinary Player Options, inside of it contains, what did, what did you call the Rogue? A harmacist. A harmacist, right? A harmacist. Um, so, <laughs> overall, uh, actually, do you want to touch on how you came up with that in the overall archetype design? Well, I mean, I pulled the term from, like, um, support character characters in various games that you'll play as a DPS. But, basically, the harmacist is a rogue who has medical skills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Instead of a pharmacist, you get it? You look confused. Yes. Does this hold on lines of, like, I want to sneak attack, but I was going to specifically go for that uh, Achilles right there? Some of it. Um, Be not all of it. Because you have medical knowledge, so you know where to stab. Yeah, right? <laughs> I know your artery is here. So if you're looking for a unique healing experience, because let's be honest, the reason healers are always so hard to find is what? They're not fun. Yeah, they're boring. Well, I think we were very successful in finding a way to make a stabby, stabby character balanced and still um, put out a good amount of damage. Obviously, it's not going to push out like the assassin can, but mm -hmm. it's still pretty high damage with the sneak attack and stuff. So, so if you're looking for that unique non-magical class, then man, the extraordinary uh, player option has exactly what you're looking for. So, I'm a healer, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, sneaky healer sounds really interesting. I'll heal you, but you'll never know. <laughs> About that, so like Anna from Overwatch, <laughs> I certainly feel better, but I don't know why. Um, all right, so we all know that humanoid bottom bodies are very complex, you know, few fully understand the intricate network that allow a body to function. Well, luckily, there are a few out there that study these complex um features. So, this is a subclass of the road that you pick up as your third archetype at third level. So what do you think the first core abilities we're going to give them is as soon as they pick up this, this archetype? Sneak heal. <laughs> Medicine. Medicine, right? Oh, okay. Sneak heal is a good answer, though. I'll give you credit for that one. <laughs> so they're going to give them the herbalism kit, and you're going to give them the med uh, medicine scale proficiency because you're going to be a practitioner of the healing arts, then that's going to be in perfect, uh, perfect uh, detail. And what's interesting about it is the way we were able to tie that kind of in to the core design of the class and the mechanics. Um, <laughs> so the very first ability you get after you get the proficiency bonuses is called the surgical precision. Um, and I really like this overall concept. Uh, do you want to touch on it a little bit, Ian? Why? Starting at third level, you... Well... Your skills with uh, surgical tools and anatomy has made your attacks that much more deadly. Wow. What weapon attacks against humanic creatures with daggers and darts score critical hits at 19 and 20? Ooh. Guess <laughs> what? The champion isn't the only one that gets bigger hits. Yep. Now, this for a rogue is a huge boon. 
But this boon is offset by the fact that you need very many other damage dealing buff abilities other than what your rogue yep. default toolkit is. What do you guys think about this? It definitely makes sense thematically. And yeah. It, like you said, it kind of keeps them in the fight in terms of damage. I like the thought of darts because you can reflare them as like little scalpels. Or yes. <laughs> or <laughs> Absolutely. Or syringes. Ooh, oh. syringes. Uh, it's not coated in poison. It's a syringe filled with poison that you're throwing and injecting in people. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Uh, uh, Harmasis. Also, your drug dealer. <laughs> 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 You're addicted to heroin. Dealing drugs. <laughs> so, um, so because we don't the because the I keep wanting to say harmless things, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> because the uh, sawbones doesn't get a lot of um, damage increasing abilities. This was kind of a, a good staple for the players to want to pick it up and you get at the early level and you get it right away. And if you manage to basically create a willing build for the rogue. They can yes. double down on this. Oh yeah, ah, double double down. I love it. Um, and that's kind of the, the the core right there. But obviously, we're going sawbones. We're going rogue. We're healing. So this also is interesting because is there any other non magical healers? Not uh, uh, yes, the monk. The monk. Yes, the chiropractor monk. <laughs> so they that's use the key, right? Yeah, or just like bending your back. Anyway, so this is another okay. kind of area that isn't really tapped into. Um, by the, the the company who shall not be named. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to give him another ability at third level, Brandon. <laughs> we have Mercy Monk. <laughs> we have Mercy Monk. I didn't know that. Yeah, painful fists are feeling cautious. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to give him the herbal remedy. Now, what is an herbal remedy? Well, at third level, you're able to create a common healing agent. During a short or long rest, you can create herbal poultice mixtures using your herbalism kit. Now, you can create a number of doses equal to your proficiency bonus. The herbal remedies lose their power after 24 hours of being created. So, you can't stockpile them in there. <laughs> but, additionally... Oh, a chiropractor, okay. A chiropractor? <laughs> yeah, I see what you did there. I L at first because the way it was. Uh... <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, additionally, when you get this at you level up, it gets a little uh, stronger. Uh, it is worth noting that um, an herbal poultice uh, functions in a little bit different ways from a more traditional uh, healing option. So the first thing you can do is you can create an herbal antitoxin. Mm -hmm. As part of your poultice, right? Which basically allows them to grant advantage to anybody that drinks it uh, against saving uh, poison and disease for one hour. So if you know you're going into like a swampy area, mm -hmm. you can kind of create some of these in advance and buff up your team to protect against the swamp rules. What's on your mind? Oh, okay. Which one of my... Sure, Goodberry, yeah. Oh, no, it's podcasting. You produce bed this? Yeah, this is spell casting though. We produce one last for 24 hours and so on. Yeah, so um, it's worth noting the, that we have a multitude of different uh, poultices, um, a couple of different ones. Now we talked about the first one. Now we've got the herbal poultice. This is the one that's going to probably be used the most often. <laughs> um, as an action, uh, you can use a single dose of the poultice to basically tend to wounds on a creature. This includes restoring hit points equal to your level plus your proficiency bonus. Uh, creatures can't regain hit points from this until they finish a shorter long rest again. No, your level or it's level? Uh, your level. Your level. So the higher level you are, the more effective you are at making a bullet. Oh, sorry. And, Typo. And, <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> just for clarification, your creature's level or your rogue level? I'm pretty oh. sure it says character level. Okay. Not rogue level. That's, what I clarify. that's an important distinction yeah it is so, uh, <laughs> but it is still limited by how frequently you can regain the benefits sure which was necessary to keep it in line with spell gas right? I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie reading through this uh archetype i kept on thinking about the duct tape mage meme <laughs> that i see pop up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andrew's like this is what i've been wanting yeah like some guy died on the ground dude you're gonna heal me Shh. <laughs> Get on the table. <laughs> He's annoying, Dave. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, but, uh, that's the next one. 
You want to tell us about the next one? This is the one I think that got the most positive feedback um, from the playtesters. Uh, it's called the Potent Potion of Healing. Uh, this is pretty neat. You mix herbs with your herbalism kit and expanding 50 gold pieces worth of materials. You can create a single potent potion of healing. A creature who drinks the magical red and green fluid regains a number of hit points equal to 2d4 plus double efficiency bonus. So it's like a regular uh, healing potion, but not, but better. not the plus two. Yeah, because it starts off at plus two. Yeah. It basically two allows you to plus. create potions. It still costs as much as it has to stay balanced, but because you have a natural knack, you actually make them better. Yep. Even the crappy ones yeah, become cool. better. Yeah. Yeah, and it takes some action to administer it. But what, uh, what we struggled with and what really makes us cool is that 50 gold becomes less of a cost the higher level you get. Mm. So even when it's only 2d4 plus 6, that's still a boon even at higher levels. So yeah. Now, before we move into the, the next ability, what is your guys' overall thoughts of this core mechanic of the Sawbone that you can find inside our Extraordinary Expeditions book or our Extraordinary uh, Player Options? I do think you will see the most mileage of this at lower levels, mm -hmm. but if I say two, that's where most games are anyway. So that's also that's a, a fair point. And I'm not saying saying that this will be useless at higher levels because it will, keep, especially in the middle of like combat potentially or in between combat, keep players up and get them back on their feet. Yeah. And there's definitely something to be said about that. Absolutely. What about you, B? I would want to try this. It looks fun. It sounds fun. I'm just imagining what it would feel like to drop a sneak attack with the ability at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, that's where the most of the damage comes from this. I'm not going to lie, a Sparky probably is going, hey, assassin, rogue, I do what you do, but better. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can do, I can do better. No, you can't. Yes, I can. You're already dead. <laughs> <laughs> no. You can do no. Um, so... What I really liked about uh, designing and doing this was that it gets away, it gets, it gets rid of the, the, the issue that people have with playing a healer. Sure, you're not going to put out the most damage, but critting more often, even if it's with a dart or a dagger, is still a very high damage per round. Especially if you pulled off with a sneak attack. <laughs> Yes. Well, and if you're dual wielding, as you mentioned earlier, yep. you basically are doubling the amount of uh, chances you're going to be able to get the sneak attack. Yep. Right? And the crit range is doubled. So it definitely is an uh, interesting mechanic. How do you think it blends with some of the other uh, core rogue abilities? I don't have the core rogue ability. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> cutting, cutting dodge, I think it was. Cutting action. Yep. Cutting action. Uh, evasion. Uh, a more basic healer that make, that the enemies might target, but some of their abilities might keep them in the fight. Yes, that's actually, I'm glad you said that, because that's exactly the response I was looking for, because yeah. one of the risks of being a healer typically is their soft, especially player talent, and no longer kind of fit in that line. I mean, rogues are sometimes squishy compared to the martial classes, and they don't just want to be caught in the open, but they have ability at least to work around that. Yeah. That, so, that would be neat, Andrew, but that, this one can only uh, create a night turn twenty with uh, daggers and. Yes, yes, it, that's very. Let's make sure that's clear. Only, crit range only applies to da dark, darts and daggers, so no more, you know, big giant uh, right here in the face. So, I mean, you can, but you lose that benefit. So that's why right. would you? Uh, all right, so going up to ninth level, they actually get their medical examination ability. Uh, so if they spend at least one minute interacting or observing another character outside of combat, they can learn a lot of information about its anatomy. So the GM basically can tell you up to two pieces of information about that creature. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Fighter ability. It's the fighter ability that people say is worthless. We made it not worthless. <laughs> so the D GM can reveal the, the strength and the, uh, two pieces of information about the creature's strength and uh, weaknesses of your choice. So that's immunity, resistance, and vulnerabilities right out the gate. So this rewards what type of play? The observant one, or those who are cautious, or those who plan ahead. <laughs> yes. What do you think about that, Pete? That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of uh, how many times this could help. Five players and trying to figure out something. 
about the big bats because when I run monsters, uh, I've actually had a player who's sitting off side, by the sidelines with the monster manual. He's just kind of like flipping the pages. I probably noticed it. He's like, what are you doing? It's like, your monsters don't seem accurate. It's like, that's because I'm not using any of the monsters in the monster manual. I give them my own attributes because I know you're looking for them. <laughs> See, that's... Uh, that's... Like, well, I don't know what it's weak against. Good. You're not supposed to. <laughs> um, I do also encourage that uh, GMs, if you're not already doing this, make sure that players do get the opportunities to get these inter- pieces of information through research or interaction with NPCs, uh, etc. Um, so what do you get? What do you, I mean, this is a pretty interesting ability, right? Yeah. It really fits that rogue theme of about, well, let me go observe, see what I can learn from them, you know, and, and enhances the potential reward by being able to know a vulnerability is huge. Mm-hmm. Nothing worse than fighting a monster and find out it's immune to something. That's what all your spell slots you took you for that day or whatever, right? That you, you prepared. Get, you get totally flavor as a little thing. What's the scouter say, Vegeta? Is it a nine thousand? Yeah. Uh, all right. So it is worth noting that at the GM's discretion, you might uh, also realize you know a piece of interesting lore um, just by it. So that's up to uh, the GM, and that always has been right. Yep. So uh, one of the, the 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 next abilities is study anatomy. Um, you want to talk a little bit about this, Ian? Yeah, and you get this at the 13th level. During a long rest, you can research and study a specific type of creature. You choose from one of the following creature types from the, this very long list. You have, a, <laughs> you have advantage on medicine and nature checks related to that chosen creature type. And then you can now use your special persistent against said chosen type. And additionally, you can use your action to use an anti toxin to heal hit or potion of healing. Which yep. there it is. Yep. Uh, and this feature will tell you use a game during a long rest. Now the, the company that shall not be named insists you can't use potions as a Jermaine Crawford. Yeah, as well, whatever, he still works for them. Yeah. Anyway, it says you can't use potions because they're magical as a bonus, as part of your uh, thieves the thieves yep. uh, what is that ability? Fast hands. Yep. I said F it at thirteenth level, yes you can. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, uh, the feature does last until you use it again uh, or during a long time. So you basically are opening up a medical book and looking through it to learn about a creature specifically for the immediate access and bonuses that come with it. Uh, Not going to lie, but my first reaction was when I thought about this was back in the webcomic Dr. McNinja when he... When the man gets to yell at one time, Dad, "Hey, man, love butt cheek. That's his weakness." <laughs> what? Yeah, but <laughs> but then I realized, wait, that's actually a thing. Especially if you, because deer hunters know if you can shoot a deer in the butt, that's actually one of the best places you can actually shoot them because it can't jump. No, because there's the main artery there; they'll bleed out fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so is that saying like, uh, if my rogue sits down and they're reading through his book, right, and they learn kobolds, like yep. it's another thing to do with and but the next time they look through it's like okay we saw a bunch of kobolds let's see how about some basilisks okay basilisks you just it only like, yeah well kobolds? it's more like preparing a spell right mm-hmm. where you have to keep it in your forefront because while they learn it a general doctor versus a a uh, very specific doctor right a specific specialist knows everything about that but a general constantly has to flip to remember about specific details. Plus, it's a balancing uh, mechanic. Stop judging me. Okay. Judge, <laughs> judge, judge, judge. And specialists make more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. We all know how often we get the capstone abilities. Never. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's that. Uh, I want to design an RPG, and it's not going to take years to get to the level cap. <laughs> uh, all right. So we had to give a really appropriate ability for the capstone for the Sawbones Rogue. Now, we did say, yes, yes, they're healers first, blah, 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 blah. But that just means they know how to hurt you. Yes. <laughs> we would be remiss if we didn't give them something that allowed them to take advantage of all of that medical knowledge. Brandon, do you want to tell us about bloodletting? Bloodletting. Hold on. At 17th level, you've mastered the complexity of the anatomy. And have learned this uh, to spot a target's weakness with intense scrutiny. <laughs> oh, I'm watching shit. you. 
Uh, this allows you to take advantage of their vital areas to deliver a fatal blow. Oh, shit. Choose a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you. As a bonus action, mm, bonus uh, you action. can make a DC 13 wisdom. That's, a check. 18. Oh, that's, that's definitely that's, 18. I said 13 tonight. Yeah, uh, 18. <laughs> I'm going blind. Sorry. Uh, on a success for the next minute. Minute. Ten round. Wow. Yeah. Don't get too excited. Um, the sun's jiggling. <laughs> on, a, on, a hit, <laughs> on a hit with a melee weapon, the creature instantly dies. What the fuck? Oh, if they have less than 60 points. <laughs> like, holy shit! Regardless of your damage, on a failure, the creature becomes immune to this feature for 24 hours. So that's, that's pretty cool. Because they don't have vital components. Can we also point out the fact uh, that um, rogues get double proficiency with their skills? Yes. And... At a certain point, they can't roll below a 10. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's why that got dropped more than one. It started off uh, almost equal to power word kill. Yeah. And needed to be dropped significantly. <laughs> In some ways, it seems similar to me to the... We have the open hands monks. <laughs> Which mechanic? Really. Um, covering palm. They get that, the one I get at five? No. Mm. Or is that the death one where they can just stab punch one somebody and they can die like when they decide? Forty-eight points of yep. damage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this one's definitely. So, so my point is, there's a precedent for something like this. Well, yeah, and we're uh, the the power word kill spell does this, but better. Yeah. It's like a ninth. It's also uh, not yeah. the proper definition. Low lighting. Uh, low lighting is far more disturbing. I don't need to know. Thank you. <laughs> so, audience, bloodletting is the. No, uh, shut up. I wrote, I wrote of... a word and then looked for a cool bitch and synonym, okay? Oh, God. It's the, it's the medieval <laughs> act of draining your bad blood when you're diseased in the whole thing. So, people would end up killing themselves because they were draining their blood. Thanks for that. Trying to heal themselves. That's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. But, anyway, so <laughs> this is potent. It is strong. It does require a successful check. Uh, wisdom, every time they do it, it does consume a bonus action. It does have a requirement. Mind you. At 17th level, do you know how many how hard a sneak attack crit can do? Yeah. Basically, it's just an I win button for weak monsters. Um, but it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Overall, um, what do you guys think about the Sawbones Rogue from Extraordinary Expedition slash Extraordinary Player Options that you can pick up now and support a small content creator instead of the company that shall not be named? One of the, the strength of the rogue, rogue classes is utility, and I think this is an archetype that taps into that. Yep. What about you, B? I don't know. I got distracted. <laughs> oh, Andrew uh, has a good question, apparently, that I can't see. It, it's, so. it's up. It's about a... Do you think first-time gamers Do I think that first-time GMs should allow content from our book? Or should they wait until they have a better handle on it? Players' abilities and options is not your responsibility most of the time. So there's no problem from the player options perspective. Yeah. You're not expected to know everything all the time. And we are all DMs anyway, and we'll be the first to admit we don't know everything. Yeah. And these are our adventure book, for instance, is designed for simplicity, so you don't need to be an expert. And honestly, even if you are an expert or a new person, you're going to find value in the books. They're not going to be any more complex than anything else you might find or buy, I guess. Yeah. So I would say I wouldn't restrict yourself from third-party content just because you don't know everything or you're new. Um, to say I've been gaming for six years and I'm still asking my players what the hell that is. Like I, I have a player doing a grave cleric. First time I've ever seen them. I have no idea what comes with it. So I'm constantly asking. It's like, oh, okay, what can they do? With it? Because that's the thing is we can't with we, ex, with the exception of weirdos like me and Ian, we can't find the time to. Most people can't find the time to read through all that content. I only read through it because I have a show about it and I write about it. But even then, I forget <laughs> it immediately after I read it. Yeah, he remembers most of it. Ish. Ish. So, and, and I played official society games or or eventually league where even the DMs don't seem to know everything. <laughs> yeah. So 
get what you want, what, support your creators, learn the stuff that you know, have fun. That's that's all we want. And if you do find that it's overwhelming, then take your time and get get acclimated until you feel comfortable taking that step. But I'm I'm very much of the jump in the pool head first, whether there's water or not. So, <laughs> and that's how you broke your ankle. No. Yes. <laughs> so you do you, bro. And uh, this this is uh, unbiased. Because even if you're a new GM, you still don't know what all the uh, classes are. Yeah. yeah. So regardless. I mean, shoot, when I ran a monk at Jasper's game day when we went there, I even had the dungeon master going, you can do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's forget where you kicked that guy off and he went flat like, uh, off the tower. Yeah. The, the damn pier? Apparently they can, like, that. No. No, I don't think they can. Feet's a lot. It's a warlock feet. All right, yeah. so, yeah. All right, so I think that'll do it for our main topic today. We get to read content? Well, when I'm on the toilet. That's lovely. That's the best time to read, that or when I'm in a bath. Did I just lose man cred for admitting that I love baths? No. I love a bath. Nothing better than I got bath, bath bombs and shit. It's awesome. With the bath bombs, the candles. There's well, candles. I will, some candy G. My wife rolled a nat 20 <laughs> on awesome ways when she bought me a big thing of bath bombs. Like, who does that for their husband? And he's like, ah, I'm going to take a bath now. And you ask, will we allow the saw building clash of classes if it ever comes back? Of course. If it ever comes back, we'll see. Maybe. Yeah, it was fun, but man, I'll just we'll be behind the scenes on that one. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of work to do. All a right. A lot of work. Oh my God. So, <laughs> before we move on to our honor tips and tricks, I want to take a moment to let everyone know that now. <laughs> we have a new project coming up soon. Our Kickstarter for Alex's Bombastic Oddities launches February 21st for any tabletop RPG. Very so nice. watch out for our social, watch on our social medias, our email updates, all that stuff. Please help support that. Um, with the, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, so we can use all the help we can get making sure that this uh, is successful. So, oh. So, if you don't know, uh, we've had Alex Baum, uh, a very popular influencer in the tabletop RPG industry. I've uh, been on the show several times. Woman's Hilarious runs my games of initiative and injury. And she has these collection of lore and story that she built over years. And it is phenomenal. If you haven't watched the initiative and injury games, go back and watch them. You can find them on the on our YouTube at youtube.com slash Alex Baum. And... We will. Uh, uh, she shares that knowledge of her gods. If you don't know who Boozy is, you're missing out. Best damn deity in any game I've ever been in. He's fun. He's a, a douche and loves trickery, just like me. It was great. Um, but it's a collection of fantastic gods, new races. The Iote, I think, uh, is how it's pronounced. I always I see it in my mind, but I never know if I'm saying it right. The Iote, which are kind of a mix of uh, like kind of like the Genasi, right? They're half elementals. And those are really fun. They have unique powers, unique abilities. It's going to be great. But what's really interesting is all the oddities. She has a vast list of just random things you can generate from these tables to throw into your D&D games. And they are so much fun and ridiculous. So definitely check it out. Consider becoming a backer. Ah, uh, freaking fat thumbs. Yeah! <laughs> Kiwi does like Alex. She's awesome. All right, moving on to our honor tips and tricks. Yeah. We have a new monster, the Zombie Plague Bringer. Before I even talk about it, what do you think it is? A rotting zombie corpse that spews disease. Oh, that's a really good guess. What about you, B? Do you got a guess? That's my thought. It's a Zombie Plague Bringer. What if I told you that oh, when wait, it dies? Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, okay. Wait for the scroll so you can see it, and then no, be like, I know the answer. Zombie Plague Bringer. That could be some a person who is bringing on a plague of zombies. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> All right, so uh, <laughs> this little bastard uh, has corpse explosion. When you kill it, it just explodes and spews a vile, decaying disease onto the creatures within 10 feet of it when it dies. Uh, so, yes, I smashed it! What is that smell? <laughs> is going to be the surprise your characters aren't expecting we started with the mummy to get a nice cr3 um they must make a con save or get this rotting disease that if they 
die turns them into a plague bringer themselves. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about this concept? I just had flashbacks to when I was playing Dragon Age, the spell Virulent Walking Bomb. <laughs> I, I don't remember that one. It's in, the RPG, it's in the tabletop RPG at the very least, but walking, the Walking Bomb spell is you basically infect your opponent's blood with a spiritual disease, and if they die from the damage, because there's ongoing damage, mm-hmm. they explode. Yeah, Virulent awesome. Walking Bomb basically does that, but it spreads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. What? So this slowly turns players into one? Yes. Yep. So it's worth noting that it requires a successful DC 18 wisdom medicine check or a lesser restoration healing spell to cure it. Um, so you'll eventually get it, but you probably die. It deals damage every round. Yep. And uh, if it kills somebody, um, they're boned. Ah! <laughs> they're boned. Get it? If it comes off. How long does this last? Until it's removed. So they're going to take 2d6 poison damage every 6 seconds to make it to the next town? They ain't going to make it to the next town. That's the point. Either you have the lesser restoration spell, you succeed on a wisdom check frantically, or for Phil three? gets it. That's so sad. <laughs> I know, Not for me. I think it's great. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, we should have took the wisdom uh, medicine check scale because nobody ever takes that, right? <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, Andrew says something interesting here. You want to drive your players nuts? Give them a weapon of warning and make it a broken magic so that it goes off sometimes when there's no danger. <laughs> That's glorious. Um, overall, it's a pretty fun monster. Uh, I can see it being uh, fitting right into any uh, area uh, that you want to go viral. Like our show. Help us go viral. Share this shit. All right, that'll do it for our that's monsters. Really nice. <laughs> Bring your zombie. Yeah. Who usually does the, do the encounter? Be I'll do the encounter. It's called Can murky. You read? I know your eyes are old. Murky depth. Oh my god, it sucks. Three more years, man. Then you're gonna climb. No, then we're old, dude. We're already old. Well, when you hit your fortieth birthday, you're officially old. Oh, it's true. At least you've been saying I've been old for years. <laughs> Uh, murky depths. As the party wades through the murky black waters of the marsh, they suddenly hear a loud, guttural noise. <laughs> As they look around for the source, they see a group of 2D4 plus 2 giant crocodiles emerging. What the fuck? <laughs> After the war, their eyes lock the party. The crocodiles are fiercely territorial and will attack anyone who intrudes on their territory. Oh, this is a noise. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, it is. Sounds like a boogie. <laughs> <laughs> Just as the party is about to engage the giant crocodiles, they hear a loud splashing noise behind them. They turn to see a 20 foot long crocodile, twice the size of the others, charging at them from the rear. <laughs> dish, 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 dish. <laughs> this crocodile is a rare creature be as a gargantuan crocodile. Mm-hmm. And is even more dangerous than the giant crocodile. Well, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> God. Uh, the party will have to fight their way through the giant crocodiles and the gargantuan crocodile if they want to continue through the marsh. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward. So, uh, the murky water and uneven ground of the swamp makes it difficult for the characters to move and fight effectively. Ouch. You should design, like... Oh, you, your character speed is halved. I should design encounters, is that what you said? No, you design, like, the, the kind traps. of encounter is, like, just screw fuck my players. That's true. If they manage to defeat the crocodile, wait, 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 I missed. Each character speed, and they have disadvantage on dexterity checks and saving throws. Ouch. It sucks. If they manage to defeat the crocodiles, they can continue on their way. But yeah. they should be careful, as they may encounter more dangerous creatures in the treacherous swamp. I, when I run encounters like this, I like the monster to be unkillable. You can kill all the little ones, but the big one is something that requires you to kind of get clever about fighting. Maybe banishment. Faster. <laughs> um, or just running away in general while you're trying to fight. You've got kind of this battle chase thing going on, right? <gasps> what do you guys think about that? So I do have one quick question. What step like are we using for the gargantuan crocodile? Hmm? Uh, a gargantuan creature. I would say purple worm. Or whatever you want. I didn't. I didn't have one in mind. I just say make a giant one. 
Take a giant crocodile and see if its numbers up by two. Sure. <laughs> even more than that. But yeah, so the yeah. idea behind that is that you're fighting all these little ones. You're running through mucky what? waters. What? This thing is chasing you, and you can't beat it by just swinging a sword, right? You need to find a way to delay it. She's a trap. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I would agree with that. That could work. Just so every time someone uses magic on them, it just reflects back and hits them. All right. <laughs> ah, shit! Fireball! It didn't work the first time. I thought it might work the second time. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for our encounter. Our magic item is... The Black Dragon Acid Scale Mail. That's a mouthful. Yes, it is. It's rare and it requires attunement. Uh -huh. And this shimmering black scale mail is made from the scales of a black dragon. Treated with a special asset that gives the armor its dark hue. And they're really a nice uh, glimmering sheen, in my personal opinion. <laughs> the scales are infused with the dragon's innate magical ability to breathe acid, and they grant this ability to the armor's wearer. While they're wearing this armor, they can use an action to exhale a 50-foot cone of acid. Yep. And each creature must make a dex saving throw, taking 3 6 acid on a failed save, or half as much on a success. As the damage option has passed and dissolves organic matter, it touches. Yeah. <laughs> and the armor has an AC of 16 and is immune to acid damage, or rather, makes the wearer immune to acid damage. That's a great clarification. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a terrible writing. <laughs> Somebody should fire Justin. Yeah. <laughs> and they also grant fire resistance to the wearer. And the armor has three charges, and it begins 1d3 at dawn. You can use your action to expand one charge and release, well, a 15-foot gun of acid as mentioned above. Ah, well, clearly, I, clearly I left in some of my notes when I was just drafting it. Hopefully you uh, updated it from the blog. <laughs> the beginning, it, it was, sounded like it was worded, like the armor was breathing acid, not the user. That sounds way cooler. Uh, it's, it's like you're... you're that thing, like like what's uh, it was a Cyrax or Sector? One of them they open their chest, their chest, and just bomb will fall out or a missile will shoot. Cyrax does that, I think. So sector, sector shoots sector, the rockets. Sector, yeah, he shoots, he the, shoots rockets. the rockets. The other one shot drops the bombs. Mortal Kombat yeah. for old people. Yeah. Or the armor, can, or this armor lets you do the combat by doing a Hadouken. <laughs> oh, I love that. It <laughs> has a mouth that opens on its own. That is way cooler. We're going with that. I like this item revised immediately. Good job, Kiwi. The armor definitely is the thing releasing the gout of flame. Okay. Like the timer. Yes. Nice flame. You know what? Stop talking to me. <laughs> Where are my feelings? Bring your your party. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what the party's not. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> you know what I'm envisioning? Uh, like Iron Man, right? He's, little, he's got that little chest blaster thing, right? In the beam, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's find it. <laughs> that he knows what that's called. I've never heard it called that. Is that like in the comics? Yeah. Because they definitely never call that in the show. Yeah, anyway, He knows everything. I wouldn't say he knows everything. Just more than he would think. No, no. The wife I feel and I like were... he's one of those people that has those little calendars and it gives me useless fact about nerds. The wife and I were in Barnes Noble the other day. It's like, I want this board game. It's huge. I've seen it before. I want to play it. But I don't know how to play it. It's like, I'm pretty sure Ian does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, it's something about zombies in a giant house. Oh, uh, House on the Hill? Okay. Okay. Zombie side? No, that's not it. No, she doesn't want that. All right, so Get moving on, <laughs> our Dungeon Master tip of the podcast is balance and reward. Yeah. Bet you get Have a good balance of challenge and reward in your game. I actually see people suck at this sometimes. Make sure that I'm actually guilty of this, honestly. I think, I think every, every DM's guilty of this at some yeah. point. Make sure that the players are consistently making progress, but also make sure that they are faced with meaningful challenges that test their skills. It doesn't make for fun if, A, they're steamrolling everything, though some people will find that fun. Children especially. Yep. Um <laughs> But also that the challenges actually have weight, right? Good balance of the story and the challenges and the rewards help keep the game interesting and engaging for the players. Everyone loves loot. They love boons. They love people worshipping them in the game. They love that stuff. So <laughs> if the challenges are too difficult and there's little reward for the player's effort, they may become frustrated and kind of lose interest. You've got to be careful. Yeah. 
Like, who wants to be like, we conquered a mighty dragon? What'd you get? I got a bag of holding. I got a rock. <laughs> it's black. She's covered in acid. She's tigers away. That's bullshit. <laughs> see any tigers around? <laughs> I like that. Um, so, on the other hand, though, Ugh. if the challenge is too easy and the re- rewards are too generous, the game may become boring and feel too easy. I know what I'm saying. So having a good balance is important to reward that sense of progression. And it's something that we as dungeon masters can stumble over uh, mm-hmm. enough that it needs to be said here on the show for you. <laughs> no, this is horse shit. But my players have gotten to a, like one of the mo- most important temples in their game. And they used uh, the spells of visibility and wind walk to walk by fucking everything. They just... That's great. And somehow they talked me into believing that uh, if they walk into a man- magic field, they sh- they can still be the way they are because they had it cast outside the field. Before they entered. That's not how that works. I don't think at all. That is, that's not at all how it, it works. They should have popped right out. But yeah. Mm-hmm. It's gone. But I re- realized... Because I, I lost a character for that, and if it was ruled wrong, I'm going to be pissed. Oh. I jumped on top of a beholder once and i don't remember i had a buff or something on my barbarian and it fizzled instantly when i jumped on the bastard <laughs> ryan it was your fault and now my inner rules lawyer is going for a second you were on top of the beholder therefore not in front of it no line. i grabbed when i jumped on it i said on top. i jumped on it and grabbed it okay. by its big eye okay uh, <laughs> so i was literally in its cone and i was like that was stupid well, well, one time I was trying to basically short change the entire session by over an hour like so our Goal is to break into this uh, wizard's tower and steal an item, right? Yep. Okay, wizard cast invisibility on me. I'm going to cast passive without trace on, my, on myself because I'm an arcane trickster. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> breaking everything. That's, that's, what, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, it is. Right? I was trying to figure out where this was coming from. I was like, okay, none of them know Windwalk. Where's that going? Wait a minute. One of them earned a ring of uh, some of the genie. Or, uh, genie. It's, it's a legend, legendary item. Yeah, but it was just a random roll. And the genie can do that. Yep. It can only stay for an hour before they disappear. So they use player shift to shift to like her native plane where they like yep. get a, a long rest. But they didn't kill the mage that they were fighting in the first place and she used uh, sending to warn everybody in the fire temple. Hey, they just used this. They're probably going to come back. We should get ready for that. Yeah. They did that and uh, they ran into a glyph ward of dispel magic and they disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, bitch! And no, I'm just- we're by now flashing back to the game of Pathfinder where we went to a mansion which has three basic levels as part of a dungeon. And we found that all out of the way. I'm like, really? Shapes on the floor, shapes on the floor, shapes on the floor. Bomb level. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. That'll do it for our dungeon master yeah. tip. <laughs> our player tip of the podcast is don't, don't be, be a, a dick. dick. And you can avoid dick dude by being well rounded. What the hell does that mean? Well, be open to trying new things. I was gonna say. Yeah. RPGs are a game of endless possibility, and the best way to get the most out of them is to be open to trying new things. Stepping aside, stepping outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Don't be afraid to take risks and try new approaches and challenges. You know, a well-rounded character in your RPG is also more interesting from a roleplay perspective as well. They all will have more dimensions to their personality and their background, and which can make for a more engaging and immersive role-playing experience. That being said, yeah, it's important to note that a well-rounded character doesn't necessarily mean a character who is equally skilled in yep. every area. It's okay to have strengths and weaknesses, yep. as long as you have a good balance of abilities that allow you to contribute to the party in a meaningful way. Please don't be that person that specializes in the one thing that'll come up once. Yep. Don't do that. Because then you put more pressure on the DM to make sure they're going out of their way to include that. And you're useless the rest of the time. Yep. And I think it's a good point to make, too, because I definitely encountered some people and just some people with the mindset of, well, I made a flawed character because I think that makes my character interesting. Like, yeah, but your character's useless. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, but worthless. What do you think, B? I think I have a few players that are worthless. Yeah. So, if you're like, in Brandon's game, you should be listening to this. 
You're not I, in Brandon's I don't think game. anyone watches. Why aren't you in Brandon's game watching this show? Yeah. As a matter, like, matter of fact, uh, he doesn't even do. That's okay. He's never going to find out. <laughs> like making fun of Amish people. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's okay. It's just. It's just yeah. Um, no. Uh, he has a fighter, Goliath fighter, yeah, but his whole wheel is that he's a blacksmith. So okay. Every session he's trying to make something. It's like, okay, think, cool. Think, think, think. Because mm-hmm. he's got a uh, a mobile black blacksmith station with him on a wagon. Did you let him have that? I did. Well, there you go. And it's funny because Burn it. it's the uh, spelljammer <laughs> campaign, so they have the spelljammers like hugging down the ships. No, I don't really know. I'm build a is there a bay door? Like there he is. It's like can I get on the ship? Maybe give me some rolls. He did figure out how to get up there, but it's always every session is. I want to make this. I want to make this. I want to make this. Like you realize, there's only a oh, very limited amount of weapons you can make, right? Yeah. yeah. So that that gets a good spell to kind of reference to be able to figure that yeah. out. Ooh. All right, so yeah, good balance of abilities and contribute in a meaningful way. Be a team player. Yeah. Holy hell! I remember a flashback to one time we were in a game I played years ago where a guy basically built a rogue who put, made his high stat charisma and made dexterity their dumb stat and specialized in etiquette for their main skill, and they tried to convince everything we encountered, but. My etiquette is like, dude, it's a swamp beast or a golem. It doesn't give a crap about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's what I think of your etiquette. Throw a pile of poo at it. <laughs> All right. Ew. I think that'll do it for our player option today. Don't! It's clear I think that'll do it for our player tip of the day. <laughs> Don't, Don't be a dick. dick! And you can avoid dickitude by listening to these weirdos. They will work. Well, well, you know, they well rounded. <laughs> I am a shit. I am a shit. Potato. <laughs> Potato. <laughs> All right. So before we close out, I want you to know we are just a couple weeks from episode three hundred. <laughs> oh my gosh! How? <laughs> How? I love it. Really now we will be looking back at some of our favorite moments on the show. I hope you guys are thank listening back to some of them, documenting them so you don't show up. Oh, I don't know. We got, I'm listening to this stuff. We've been around a lot. Yep. We've really been around a lot. Like, I feel like some, never mind what I feel like. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, we're going to be talking about our, some of our favorite moments on the show. And we would like to, love to hear from you. What are some of your favorite moments and topics as well? So, Please email them to us or message them to us on social media. You can uh, send them. Uh, let us know what are your favorite Kurt Academy moments. You know, oh, we want them cool. here because uh, we have our moments. But you're the ones that have been following us. If you're still listening, I guess you've been following us for years. If you're just starting, welcome. <laughs> My favorite moment was being hot sauce, just saying. Yeah, that, <laughs> two of those. Blew up and innards. It's good. I got a whole bunch of hot sauce bottles for Christmas. They really good. And then there was that flat layer stuff I gave you that one time. Yeah. Ooh, Brent Summer had that. I'm pretty sure my heart's still not beating. All right. <laughs> so that'll do it for our show today. Yeah. If you enjoyed the show and you want to show your support, please you know, hit the little bell, ring the little bell, hit the subscribe button, visit CritAcademy.com, pick out some of our fantastic loot, um, especially since you will hopefully – not be purchasing anything from the company that shall not be named for a while. Uh, follow us on social media. Please leave us a review and wherever you're at, just you know what, tag us in a in a comment when you have something interesting related to D and D, or if you don't, just gaming in general. Maybe I'll respond. I like that stuff. Yeah, I did want to do that plug for Andrew. We forgot about that. What plug? Uh, his his uh, thing that he was talking about. The, uh, they wanted uh, permission. <laughs> this is the <laughs> the <apology. laughs> Want a permission to do it? Uh, I think they they said that uh, mm-hmm. uh, they like to make little dice potion bottles and stuff. Uh-huh. And they're doing a give you, giveaway, and the ticket for the giveaway is the, your, your cancellation email from <laughs> being DPI. You can uh, follow over on uh, our Discord. I think is where Andrew was talking about. That. Yes, so I, I don't remember. So come join our Discord too. We talk a lot of uh, fun. So we talk a lot of crap on there. It's great. Yeah, it is pretty glorious. All right, that'll do it for our show today. <laughs> I know. I'm your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Ian. I'm your co-host, Brandon. Thanks for listening. Keep, Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, prepared heroes. heroes.